And whether you call it remote work or distributed work or flexible work, there's so many ways to look at it. I do think that we have entered a new era of work and that we're not going back to the 2019 and earlier styles of working. And there are a few reasons for it. And you hit the nail on the head when you mentioned flexibility, freedom, taking cars off roads, and the sheer cost savings of it. Real estate is the second biggest cost that corporations incur after payroll. And so if you no longer need to pay for space seven days a week when your teams are maybe only using it once or twice, my goodness, that's a huge financial burden that's now been alleviated while offering people the kind of flexibility and choice that they crave. So for me, I really see it as a win-win. This is the Player Position Podcast, where we huddle up, call the plays, and inspire you to run your ball into the end zone. Are you ready to score more game-winning touchdowns in your life, business, and career? Then listen up, because it's game time, baby. Now, here's your host, Mary Lou Kayser. Hello, hello, Team PYP. Mary Lou Kayser here. Welcome to today's episode of the Play Your Position podcast. I'm excited you have joined us for another exceptional conversation with an even more exceptional guest. You're in for a treat today. I have Amina Moreau with us. You're going to learn more about her in a minute. And she's coming to us today from the beautiful City of Roses, Portland, Oregon. Amina. Are you ready for kickoff? I am ready. I'm very excited to be talking to you again, Mary Lou. Yes, this is going to be great. So team, let me give you a little bit of an overview of Amina, and then she's going to fill in the gaps. First of all, she calls herself a serial entrepreneur, and for good reason. She has built a good number of companies over the years with some close friends. Two of those companies were acquired, and one of them even won a handful of Emmys a while back. She builds companies because she likes to be challenged, and she also is in pursuit of adding something meaningful to the world. Now, she's going to tell us more about some of the companies that she's built and the ones she's currently building in a minute, but there's a couple other things I want you to know about her. She is a tennis player and takes tennis very seriously. She sees a lot of parallels between sports and business and uses those parallels to her advantage as a CEO, an entrepreneur, somebody who looks for opportunities. In fact, she says she sees opportunities where others see roadblocks. And her current company right now is called Radius. And I'm going to let her tell you more about it. It's a fascinating concept. But before we get to that, Amina, why don't you set the stage for us and tell us your story about when you got the call to leadership? How old were you? What was going on in your life? And then maybe connect the dots between that time in your life and take us to today with what you're doing with Radius. There are so many ways to define leadership, aren't there? Yep. (laughs) And I feel like there were... So, so many moments, but if I were to identify one or two that stand out, so first of all, one thing you need to know about me is that I'm an only child and I am the very stereotypical uh, only child that for a long time was used to just getting her way because I was the only one. And so there was little competition in the household. And so I suppose that in a sense, I became a leader kind of from birth in a sense, because without siblings, I had to find a way to entertain myself and to be creative and create friendships with people that weren't by default because they lived in the household. So in in that way, I kind of became, uh, I became called to leadership in the sense that I was becoming the the leader of, of my life. But that also has some downsides. Being an only child, you know, I didn't necessarily grow up having to learn the skills of sharing and considering other people's opinions, especially if they were different from my own. 
And so when I became an employer, uh, while I was, you know, my first company was founded in, uh, in college, I didn't have any formal leadership skills that you would assume that an employer would have. Uh-huh. And so uh, I was reinventing the wheel a lot and staying with my co-founder at the time. We had never led teams before and we were finding ourselves in a position where we are, are hiring people and trying to create an environment that people want to work at and be a part of. But we didn't have any formal training in that regard. And so we we made some mistakes, but we also took it upon ourselves to just consider how, like, what would we want for ourselves in that position? And what kind of, what kind of environment do we want to create, not just for the folks who are coming and joining the team for the first time, but for ourselves and it was clear we wanted to build something really purpose-driven that we all wanted to be a part of that was bigger than any one person and that we could accomplish more together. And, you know, I think that one event in my life when I was 14 really catalyzed this sort of thinking. And it was when uh, my mom passed away somewhat unexpectedly. Oh, wow. And as a mm. young teenager, I had to learn how to... A, overcome such a huge emotional challenge, but B, take it upon myself to use that as a point, a launching pad for growth, as opposed to post-traumatic stress experience, post-traumatic growth. And I think that because I was an only child and I was also in a very loving and supportive environment up until that point, I had the infrastructure, the emotional wherewithal to to decide to become a leader in that moment. And I think that that ended up bleeding into my professional life later on as I became a more formalized leader, that it wasn't just about hiring people that you were selecting for your culture or that you knew were going to be self-starters but really trying to create an environment where everybody has the sense of autonomy and really, really wants to be here. Wow. Um, Yeah, experiencing a loss like that at such a young age, I can only imagine did catalyze so much of who who you've become um, since then. And did you, were you always drawn to entrepreneurship? I mean, did you have an inkling? Was, what did that come out of? losing your mom or or when you look back at your childhood, were you one of these kids that, you know, was drawn to the metaphorical lemonade stand or literal, you know, is that just yeah. something that's always been part of who you are? Not whatsoever. Okay, good, <laughs> fair. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's because I come from a family where the expectation is that you become a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer. Oh, These wow. are your three options, and this is what is going to please the fam. Yep. And so I was going down the pre-med track in college. And I was doing so for the most part thinking, yeah, this is definitely what I want to do. I love science. I love biology. I love helping people. This is a good fit. And then somewhere along the way, I realized, wait a minute, even though I do find these things interesting, if I really look within, it's pretty clear I'm doing this because of the expe- expectations being imposed upon me versus it really being my choice. And at the time, I was in the process of turning a hobby into a side hustle that was quickly becoming a profitable company. And my co-founder and I, we're both in school together, and and we were presented with the crossroads. We were graduating from our, our undergrad and we could continue down the road of grad school, medical school, going on to maybe getting PhDs. And we realized we're having way more fun doing the side hustle. (laughs) Can you tell (laughs) us what that side hustle was? Yeah. It was a film production company, which ended up evolving significantly. And here, almost 20 years later, it's still continuing and it has evolved and it's spun off all kinds of other startups that became successful in its own right. But, you know, my, my dad was never like, yeah, you should go into the arts, like, even though he's the one that introduced me to photography in the first place, the idea of of his daughter pursuing that as a career 
was scary for him and therefore made it scary for me. But at the end of the day, my co-founder and I, we realized this was bringing us a lot of joy Oh man. and it was profitable. We could actually make a living doing this. So why not try? And you can always go to school go back to we were in a in a fairly privileged position where if the thing failed then we could go back to school and all right so we'd be a little bit delayed but we'd also have all this business experience and so but i will say that because i was an only child and because i sort of had to fend for myself a little bit throughout my upbringing i do think that that did prepare me for some aspects of entrepreneurship because in some ways it can feel really lonely yes. and at the end of the day, especially if you're a CEO, you're a founder, that everything falls on your shoulders and the buck kind of stops with you. If something good happens, if something bad happens, at the end of the day, like it's it's your name behind it and you have to own that regardless of it, if it's something that makes you smile or it makes you go, oh, oh shoot, we've got to we got to fix this, which mm-hmm. in the journey of entrepreneurship, you have so many ups and downs. You really do and and you know, that's that's leadership right there, one on one. You know, it, there's no, no passing the buck. No, you know, the, oh, everything's great. It's I. Oh, I did this. Everything sucks. Oh, it's everybody else's fault, right? That's not leadership at all. It's no. it's what you just described. It's the good times, the bad times, and it all is right there with you. And so your first foray into entrepreneurship sounds like it. It was it was successful and. Since then, you've founded several other companies and in different industries, you know, you were in film and now you're in, what what industry would you consider Radius and, and tell uh, listeners what Radius is? Describe what this company uh, offers people. It's a really tough question to answer, Mary Lou, which industry <laughs> Radius is in because it, we're kind of creating our own industry because right. we're blurring a lot of lines. So In a nutshell, Radius is an online marketplace that turns residential properties into great workspaces that companies and working professionals can rent by the day. And so I have a lot of trouble checking boxes on things like grant applications and pitch competitions for which category we fit into because are we real estate? Are we software? Are we commercial? Are we residential? Yes. Right. All, all, <laughs> all of the above. The above. <laughs> all of the and, above. And we're really blurring the lines between yeah. what, what is a commercial property? What is a residential property? The pandemic changed everything. Yeah. Virtually every home became a place of business as we were forced in lockdowns to do all of our work from home. I mean, certainly not everybody, but it changed the paradigm. And so what we're building with Radius is, in a sense, turning a lot of models on its head. So it's hard to answer which category we we fall into. I will say, though, that you're right. It is a very different business than what I've done before, because my four previous companies were all in the marketing or media production sphere. It was film production, it was storytelling consulting, it was music licensing, it was it, it was uh, stock footage, education, but it was all in that creative industry. And then all of a sudden, left turn, we're doing real <laughs> estate now. <laughs> what? At the same time, if you think about it, music licensing and stock footage, those are also marketplaces because you have the one side of the marketplace artists contributing music and footage to a platform. And then we had ad agencies, marketing departments, and licensing those assets for their projects. So in a way, it's just like Radius because with Radius, we have property owners and managers that are listing properties on our platforms. And then we have companies and working professionals that book those spaces. And so Mm -hmm. the model is the same, but the industry is very different. Yeah. Well, I think it's a really fa- a fantastic concept. And you're not that you're not that far into this journey. When was it officially founded? The idea itself for Radius was born in August 2020 during the lockdowns. Sure. And makes so sense. it it took a few weeks to figure out, hey, this is actually a really good idea. 
<laughs> uh, we had to have some calls with advisors and talk amongst ourselves and figure out, is this just another one of our 50,000 ideas that, <laughs> you know, ideas are a dime a dozen. They are. But once in a while, you come across something that isn't just a great idea, but it's also perfectly timed. And, you know... Somebody that likes to think she has agency over her outcomes in life. <laughs> I don't like admitting how much luck and timing have to do with success, but they really do. They do. And so when you think of an idea that is this well-timed and that all of the stars in the universe are aligning in a way that makes your idea that much more relevant, you don't not drop everything and just go all in. And so that's what yeah. I've done with Radius. It's awesome. I want to share um, a post you recently, you, you actually made it today um, on your LinkedIn page. I'll, I think this it extends what you're just saying and it gives listeners um, an idea of, of why Radius now, you know, why this now and, and why it's going to be a category in the future. It's hard to get work-life separation when you're literally living at the office. After all, work from home isn't just working from home. It's living at work. I love how you flip that. And, it, you know, work from home has many upsides for companies and employees, yet it's not a perfect solution on its own. More and more companies are leveraging third places and encouraging employees to work together in entirely different non-office settings. So, you know, there were, there's the stereotypical, let's go to the, the local coffee shop or hang out in the park, right? Go to a friend's house or maybe rent a cabin. You know, we have the, um, certainly the, the vacation type places where people could go and do an offsite, for example, for a weekend or, you know, two days yep. during the week. But what you're doing is you're expanding the opportunities, not only for, for employees and for also uh, business people, you know, people like yourself, entrepreneurs with small teams to be able to rent a place for a day. That is, I think this is brilliant. And, you know, this the town that I live in currently, there are a lot of historic homes, which are beautiful and have high ceilings with, you know, gorgeous crown molding and woodwork and can give off an aura of they can stimulate creative thinking and conversation and stuff. So you're based in Portland. Do you have a market going there? You have, you actually have clients, you know, homes that are, are on your marketplace and where else are you currently Amina? Well, I'm excited to tell you <laughs> that in some regards we're nationwide. Okay. And that is a new development. <laughs> That's awesome. So since the last time we spoke, Mary Lou, yeah. uh, there have been some exciting things that have happened. So uh, we are in the process, first of all, of expanding into our third market, which is the Bay Area. And that is still somewhat unofficial, but we're making strides there and just secured our first properties and have companies um, that are starting to book, which is okay. very exciting. Yes, it is. But, we have also launched a nationwide concierge service, which for the time being is a free service that people can take advantage of. And basically what it means is that if you are anywhere in the country and you either are starting to feel a sense of burnout because you've been working from home in isolation for too long, or you are a part of a company that has either downsized their office space or gotten rid of it entirely, or you live in a geography where there's a cluster of employees, but that cluster might be 10 or 15 people. It's not big enough to have an office, but you're finding that it would be nice maybe once a week to get together for co-located work. Get in touch with me personally, with somebody on my team, and we can get you access to a radius space anywhere across the country. Oh my god. We have gosh. not officially launched in all cities, but we have a fantastic network of properties that we can um that we can call on at any time virtually anywhere. And that for us as a startup is a huge development because companies have been hiring remotely and in a distributed fashion for the last three years, more so than any other time before. Yes. And so for us as a company, it's huge to be able to 
uh, to serve people across a much larger ge- larger geography, but also knowing that people need this sort of outlet everywhere. Uh, it just means so much to me to be able to help. Yes, and you have your finger on the pulse of of the the trends related to work from home, uh, remote work, and and so forth. Obviously, media likes to spin whatever media likes to spin. From your vantage point, Amina, you see remote work becoming more permanent, and um, you know places that once were you know commercial spaces just going by the wayside because Mm -hmm. this is what, you know, the pandemic really informed a lot of people. Oh, I like this. (laughs) I don't like, I I do not miss the commute. I don't want to be stuck in traffic. I can get more if, you know, not better work done when I'm in control, in my own space and control. I mean, is is that Mm -hmm. what you're finding when you and your team do, you look at the, um, you know, analyze the data about what people want? Yes, without a doubt. Yeah. And whether you call it remote work or distributed work or flexible work, there's so many ways to look at it. I do think that we have entered a new era of work and that we're not going back to the 2019 and earlier styles of working. And there are a few reasons for it. And you hit the nail on the head when you mentioned flexibility, freedom, uh, taking cars off roads, and, and the sheer cost savings of it. Mm-hmm. Real estate is the second biggest cost that corporations incur after payroll. And so if you no longer need to pay for space seven days a week when your teams are maybe only using it once or twice, my goodness, that's a huge financial burden that's now been alleviated while offering people the kind of flexibility and choice that they crave. So for me, I really see it as a win-win. I will say that it's not for every company. There are certainly some companies that are going to force people back for even five days a week. And okay, you know, there's something for everyone. And there are some people in life who really, really love going to the office and they're going to self-select and they're going to go work for those companies. But I don't think that's the majority. And we're already seeing the trends that earlier stage companies, smaller companies are offering flexibility at far higher rates than the Fortune 500. We've all seen the headlines, the Googles, the Amazons, the Apples of the world. They are forcing people back. And those people, a lot of them are speaking up about their displeasure. Some of them are even leaving those companies. But those headlines are being made because those biggest companies, they have the biggest PR budgets. I think it's really important to note that 80% of tech companies are offering flexibility. And so those big guys that are making all those headlines, they're actually the outliers, not to mention they're the ones with the biggest real estate holdings. They've got Mm -hmm. all those sunk costs, all those offices that are sitting empty. So they are actually disincentivized to offer location flexibility. But startups that have have come to the world in the last three years, the, the majority of them have, are not signing leases. They just, they don't, you know, a startup that's two or three years old doesn't even know what's going to happen next quarter, let alone five years from now. And all of these leases, they're multi-year commitments for the most part. And so, but startups still do have a need for in-person togetherness occasionally and to get out of the house and get that work-life separation. And that's why I think that third places like Radius and otherwise are really well poised to offer a solution that that offers the best of both worlds. The in-person interaction and all the amenities of the office with the flexibility of working from home. It's halftime here at the Play Your Position podcast. And we've got ourselves a great game. While you're up grabbing another snack and topping off your favorite beverage, make sure to subscribe to the show so you never miss another play. PYP is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever great podcasts can be found. Now, let's get back to the game. Yes, I just read an article about commercial real estate stocks are, are, are down because people, these there's so many buildings that are not occupied right now. I've heard stories of 
companies that had a million square feet of space in Manhattan high rises and now are 50% occupied and that other 500,000 square feet just sits empty. And I think it's such an opportunity to reimagine those spaces for so many other things. But you and I both know that change can be slow. Yeah. Thinking about a new paradigm or or just ushering in a new paradigm isn't easy for for a lot of people. They they they're comfortable with the way things were and I also find it somewhat ironic and you might as well that these big tech companies that were at one time the the innovators, the you know, fleet of foot are now the old guard and are kind of have their feet stuck in the sand a little bit about <laughs> you know, it's like you would think they would be the the ones like yeah you know we're go- we're rolling with the times but for reasons that you just mentioned it makes complete sense that you know they're looking at wow we've got all this space that we've yep. signed commitments to we've got to fill it somehow um but to me there's an opportunity there that either people are choosing not to look at or ignoring completely uh, meanwhile, you know you and your team at Radius are off to the races and presenting a new model, a um, new way of thinking. And I know, you know, listeners of of the Player Position Podcaster, you know, we're innovative, we're on the cutting edge, and it, it's 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 a really great concept. So you've talked a little bit about, you know, creating a platform where the the, the exchange can happen. Okay, people are looking for a home to go have a meeting at say in New Orleans, right? As an example, and and you guys can hook them up with that. What about the opposite? What about people who have a place that they think, man, this would, I would love to offer my home. Tell us about that process for finding folks who fit the bill. What is the criteria? You know, how do people go about doing that? Yeah, it's, it's so much fun. Considering <laughs> it all is. the different types of properties that can be turned into workspaces. And something that we learned along the way, because of course, when we were starting this from scratch, we got to sort of invent it as we went along, but it doesn't actually have to take a lot of effort or a lot of money to take a home or any kind of residential property for that matter and turn it into a great workspace. You need fast Wi-Fi, which most residences already have. You need to have access to a bathroom, which is kind of a no-brainer. Coffee is kind of a nice to have, but then you need to have either a work workstation, like a, de- a comfortable desk with an ergonomic chair and or a meeting table. And that could be as simple as your dining room table. A really small purchase that can go a really long way is buying a, a whiteboard. If you put a whiteboard in your dining room, all of a sudden you transform it into a collaborative brainstorm space with a $50 purchase. And this is something that you could probably also use yourself when (laughs) you're working from home too. Something like a $15 HDMI cable turns your TV into a presentation space. And now your living room has been activated in an entirely new way. And so, We're talking to anyone and everyone who might have a tiny home, an apartment, uh, a mansion, a 2,000 square foot craftsman home. We even have a 1970s Airstream that has been converted (laughs) into a private workspace, but also has a beautiful backyard for maybe an an eight to 10 person uh, offsite. And so you could do a working lunch outside in the backyard. And then if you have to take a private Zoom call, you go into the Airstream where there's a desk and a great setup. And it's just so much fun, you know? It is. I mean, I, your enthusiasm, it's, it's so palpable how excited you are about what you're doing and, and all the processes. From a, from a legal standpoint, I mean, I'm sure you have contracts in place, you know, for liability and such. I mean, what's involved with that? Are there... Are there restrictions? Have you come up against any places like towns that say, you know, we don't allow that kind of thing here? I mean, I'm just curious. And I'm asking because as a a founder, 
you you have to look at all the you know the SWOT analysis, right? What are the opportunities? What are the threats? Um, what prevents somebody's place from being from qualifying outside of the obvious, like it's run down, it's got you know ants all over the place <laughs> or whatever, you know, like you have criteria in place. Yeah. Well, so you know, to answer your question about like towns, for example, and whether this has ever been disallowed. And I will say not so far. And a, a big part of it is because the things that towns and HOAs, for example, really dislike about vacation rental platforms are things that you don't really have to worry about with radius. So first of all, one of the things that municipalities and neighborhoods really care about is housing inventory, right? There are a lot of vacation rental companies who are being accused of stealing away housing inventory. Yes. And, you know, whether whether that's right or wrong, I will say that radius has a totally different approach to this. If you think about hosting on a platform like Airbnb or VRBO, just to, you know, name name a couple. There are like hundreds of them at this point. You can, it's really difficult to rent out your own home on an overnight platform like that because if you did so, you'd have to go out and find a place for you and your family to sleep. And that is a major upheaval. So folks who tend to rent out on those platforms have investment properties or they might have an ADU in their backyard and they choose to put it on the short-term rental market instead of the long-term rental market, which does take away some housing inventory. With Radius though, we have a good amount of properties that people actually live in Hmm. because we're a day-only platform. We don't do anything overnight. Right. So we have a good number of families who actually they do they go to school they they go to work they may not always work from home and so on the days that their house is just sitting empty they're able to monetize it and so in many cases we're actually helping with housing affordability which sure. is something that I'm tremendously proud of because the last thing I want to do is create a company that hurts the very communities in which our our whole foundation was built. You know, we don't have a company if we don't have hosts, if we don't have properties. We would be shooting ourselves in the foot if we were degrading those communities. I love that. I love that you have, uh, you thought of that, that you are, you know, there's that social good component to Radius, Uh that this is, um, this is a solution for a lot of problems. It's not, it's not just giving people who work from home, a chance to go experience a different space, right? Right. So on average, I mean, are do people choose, I know like with remote working spaces back in the 20 teens when that became a real big thing, the pre-pandemic, you could go in and you could you could choose a block of time. Is that how Radius works? I go on and I say, I, I would like four hours, so I want eight hours. Do you have a maximum? Do you have a minimum? Like, how does that work? All of our hosts choose their own check-in and check-out times. Okay. So some, goodness, I mean, some of them are being ultra generous, realizing that some people might have Zoom calls with people in other time zones and might need to meet with somebody at six in the morning. And so some of our listings uh, may open up at five in the morning and may go until all the way to 7 p.m. at night. Okay. Um, there are other listings for which check out check in time is eight a.m. and they might have you out of there by five or six p.m. as a as a user, as a working professional, or as a company, if you're booking a space, you can use our search filters to filter by check in and check out time to make sure that you're only looking at the listings that provide the times that you're looking for. Uh, I will say that at the moment, the smallest increment of time that you can book on the platform is a day. So okay. if you only need to meet with people for three or four hours, you are still booking for the whole day. But, and this I'm extremely happy about, our pricing is a third to a to half of what our competitors tend to charge. Like if you think about booking a sterile hotel conference room or oh, something like I've that, you're going to pay triple. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For the same amount of time. And you're probably going to have a very different sort of experience. Oh, and those spaces are so, like you said, sterile. Unless you're going to a really cool boutique hotel, which, 
you know, then you're going to pay through the roof. I mean, I, I've been sure. down that road. I know so that, that, yeah. that is fantastic. Wow. Okay. So let's, um, let's have you, I'd love for you to talk about, you, you have a passion for tennis, Amina, and, and you, you see so many parallels between athlete, athletics and, and business. So talk about how your um, tennis playing, your competitiveness um, on, you know, on the court and also just the training aspect has been so useful for you as a founder, as an entrepreneur? Mm -hmm. Well, going back to what I mentioned before about my upbringing and some of the events that happened there, you know, by the time my mom passed away when I was 14, I had already been competing on the tennis court for seven years. And so I had years of life lessons that sport teaches you about overcoming challenge, about dealing with, goodness, like dealing with cheaters. Like that's the thing. Yeah, it is. uh, Like pushing through injuries when you know that continuing to play won't permanently (laughs) damage your body. You know, you twist an ankle, but it's hurting, but you know that you can push through the pain. Like, Te- it's like it it teaches you about resilience and perseverance and it helps you define your own sense of inner strength and tennis is one of the only sports out there where coaching is not allowed during a match right so when you're playing singles it's just you mm-hmm. you have to somehow float about above yourself and have an out of body experience to more objectively assess what is happening in the situation? What is the opponent doing? What are you doing? What is working? What is not? How do we tweak? How do we, how do we test and iterate? Test and iterate is such a common mantra in the startup world. And I've been doing that my entire life on the tennis court. And then when I started my first company and then my second, third, and fourth, and now Radius being my fifth, I have a lifetime's worth of training on how to be an entrepreneur, most of which I learned on the tennis court. It's amazing. And I I wish that more kids, more girls specifically, were put early on into these sorts of, not just competitive situations, but situations on whatever court or surface type that teaches you what you've got. Yeah. And how much more you can pull out of yourself when times get tough. Yeah. I wish that for every girl, but also for every kid on the planet. I do too. And we culturally, I'm sure you're aware of this trend, have removed the experience of losing from so much of childhood. There's, there's the, the, the pendulum has swung where, you know, everybody gets a trophy. We don't want our kids to feel disappointed, you know, when that, that, and I say we collectively, um, certainly there are, you know, uh, that's part of life. And when you learn, first of all, what it feels like not to win, not to have things go your way, not to have things turn out the way you imagined, that's important because it does lead to some of those qualities that you just listed, perseverance, Resilience, overcoming obstacles, all marks of great leadership. It's not all about, you can't win all the time. It's right. That's not life. You know, it's, it's, if you, if you go out into, and you know, you live in, in, in Portland, you live in, in, in a area that's so geographically rich. If you go out and look at trees and I'm a tree, I love trees. I love bark. I love looking at their branches. I love standing by them and under them and in that, you know, in and among them in forests. And if you look at, you never see a tree that's perfectly straight. You see trees who've had to withstand storms and they're bent and and yet they still grew. And that's the same with life. And that's entrepreneurship. I mean, you, you've built your, this is your sixth company, correct? Radius? Uh, fifth. This is number five. Okay. Now, yes, you, you've had some good timing. You've had some good luck. You've had a couple of acquired, but this has not been a path of gold the whole time. You know, you, 
you have met with some obstacles just like you you did on the tennis court. And I would love for you to share just some words of wisdom for people listening who might be considering start, they have an idea, maybe they've been sitting on it for a while and the pandemic took them away and now things are opening up again. They're like, you know, I really want to pursue this. What are some recommendations to those who haven't founded a company yet what the climate is so welcoming to startups uh, right now. Yes, and in some ways it is, in some ways it isn't. But for the, I mean, the the pandemic led to an explosion of startup creation, and it's really exciting and inspiring to see. If I were to give advice to somebody who has an idea but has not done this before, first I would say I would urge you to really ask yourselves. Uh, do I really want to turn this into a business? Because not every passion can and should turn into the thing that we do for work. I am a big advocate for doing things you love. I think life is too short to spend your career just doing the the drudgery that you put <laughs> up with in order to have a paycheck. Oh my goodness. Oh, yes. I think that that is such a sad existence. And life is too short for that. At the same time, I don't think that every single hobby or passion should be turned into a business either. Case in point, I have been asked to coach tennis many times over the years, and I've always declined. Now, that's not to say that I won't take on a uh, like so- somebody that is passionate and wants a, a little bit of help here and there, and I'll just, just do that for free. But I, w- I will not become a tennis coach in the way that I've been asked, because I have, like, tennis is my, this is where I find my sense of peace. Yes. It's, it's my home. And I never want to turn it into something that feels any more pressurized than I choose to make it. And the tournaments are plentiful of, of pressure. <laughs> sure. I never want it to feel like something I'm doing just because I'm getting paid. Right. And so I would urge you to consider is this idea that I have something that I love doing intrinsically? Do I really need an extrinsic reward for it? Because, and this is what, you know, my undergrad thesis was about, uh, something called the overjustification effect, that if you give an extrinsic reward, like money or grades in school, to someone who already has intrinsic motivation to do that thing, like learning or the work that they're doing, it actually undermines their intrinsic motivation. Mm. So you take somebody that loves learning just for the sake of learning, Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you start grading them on a scale and giving them rewards when they do well. Their intrinsic motivation for learning is actually going to decrease. I don't want that to happen with my tennis. I want it to just be pure for me Mm -hmm. and for anybody that I help. Sure. And so that's one thing that I would be asking. The second thing that I would be asking is... Do I really want to put myself through this? <laughs> start up <laughs> life. You know, I mean, it's the cliche, right? It's the the Silicon Valley TV show. It's it's all of that. It's it is hard. And so, what you were saying, Mary Lou, earlier about how it's it failure is an inherent part of growth and success, and nowhere more than in startup life. And so you may have a trend of uh, like an upward trend of progress, but that line is not going to be, it's not going to be linear. It's going to be a like huge roller coaster and it's going to be persistent for a long time. It's not just a few months. It's not just a few years. It's, it, it takes endurance of these challenges for a very long time. And so you need to have many moments of introspection. Is this idea something that I am passionate about enough to weather these storms for many years to come? And if the answer is yes, then whew, that's really exciting. Mm-hmm. But if the answer is no, that's okay too. Because again, life is too short to spend miserable. Right. It is. Two amazing questions. Thank you for for putting those out there and sharing those with listeners. Um, it's great stuff to consider. Uh, and there are so many different options now. And, and it comes back to something you said at the beginning, and that is, you know, learning to lead yourself first, knowing who you are. And, you know, the fact that you were an only child and you didn't have sibling 
competition, as anybody who has siblings knows, <laughs> you know, you're competing for your parents' attention, you're, you know, competing in school and whatever it is. Um, it, it still comes down to knowing who you are, knowing what you're... And that's not always comfortable. No. Not everybody is used to asking themselves such no. personal questions. And that no. comes with practice too. It absolutely does. It absolutely does. A lot of people spend their whole lives avoiding getting to know themselves because yeah. it's too uncomfortable. And to me, as someone who's like a self-awareness queen, <laughs> I just find that so strange. But, you know, to each his own. It's, 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 we're all on our own, our own path. And it's so fascinating to intersect with, with others like, like yourself. So as we come to what has been such a fantastic conversation, Amina, I would love for you to share a couple of books that have been instrumental to you on your path of leadership. What could you share with us? The one that comes immediately to mind is Grit by okay. Angela Duckworth. Mm -hmm. And she defines grit as the combination of passion and perseverance. And what makes a person gritty? And is it something that you're born with? Is it something that you can learn? Um, spoiler alert. Uh, you don't have to be <laughs> born with it. These are things that can be developed over time. But uh, it was personally moving to me to read it, especially the chapter that talks about different parenting styles. And having read that chapter helped, un helped me understand how my childhood contributed to the type of person that I, I became and I'm continuing to become. Because there were some questions I had about the differences in my mom's and my dad's parenting styles, which were kind of almost polar opposite. And I felt resentment for to both of them for a while about each style. And in reading that chapter, I understood that while neither of their styles were ideal on their own, the average of the two, the combination of the two, actually was fantastic. And it's kind of what, I mean, ideally, both of them would have had the blends of both, but, you know, you can't live in a per perfect world. And uh, and so that chapter was was quite transformative for me because it, it gave me a little bit of peace of mind and also understanding of my parents and improved my relationship with my dad, but also helped me understand just how beneficial those styles were. Whereas before, I just looked at them like, they were crazy. <laughs> like, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I turned out this way despite that. No, I turned out this way in large part because of that combination. And that was that was really eye-opening to me and also uh, made me a better leader because now I can employ elements of those styles in my leadership moving forward. Wow. That's a real testament to your parents. Thank you for, for honoring them that way. That's awesome. And, and it's a mark of, I think everybody, I would hope everybody at some point can step back and see their parents in the way you just described. Because I think, again, I know I, I fought against my parents, not openly, but just, you know, I think when you're a strong, independent child, especially a female, you know, when you're, it's, yeah, when we have a mind of our own. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. So... And where do you hang out online, Amina, for people who'd like to learn more about you and Radius? Uh, where, where are some good places for folks to find you? I am most active on LinkedIn. So yeah. feel free to shoot me a connection request, send me a DM, and uh, happy to connect. Yeah, I can, te I can testify to this, guys. I was, um, you know, I was prepared for my conversations and Amina has some awesome content on her LinkedIn page. So definitely check her out. I will put links to her website, to her LinkedIn profile, to uh, Grit on her show notes page at pypodcast.com. So you can look for that, make it easy, along with some more details about her. And um, before we say goodbye, what, what one last bit of wisdom, Amina, could you leave Team PYP with today? Mm, that freedom is underrated. And that as leaders... I think true leadership is about giving our teams, our families, whomever we are, have been tasked with leading, creating a space where people have the freedom of choice. 
when people feel feel free, they have a sense of agency over their outcomes, they feel more committed to the mission, they feel a greater sense of purpose. And I see a lot of companies right now forcing people into things, coming into the office, working at certain times. These are all things that strip autonomy away from people. That is not leadership. That is dictatorship. Now, I am extremely excited to be building a future and to also be building a company and building a team where people have that freedom. They're not here just because of a paycheck or because they out of a sense of obligation. No, we're building a, a new future where people feel a sense of fulfillment. And that is tremendously exciting to me. Mm. Well, thank you so much for sharing your leadership journey with us today, Amina. And I know that this will be another one of your successes. Um, what a phenomenal concept. And I can tell that you you exemplify the the true essence of this podcast and also just leadership in general. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mary Lou. Hey team, Mary Lou here. Who's number one in football changes from year to year. Fashion trends come and go, same with musical tastes, but leadership skills, they never go out of style. In fact, these days, leadership is an essential survival skill for a world that demands more from us than ever before. To succeed these days, you need to know how to show up for yourself so that you can then do the work you love with people you like the way you want. The Play Your Position Leadership Playbook helps you do this, and it's free. Go to pypodcast.com to download your copy today. If being more successful this year, next year in the 21st century is on your to-do list, get your copy of the Play Your Position Leadership Playbook now. pypodcast.com. It's at the top of the page. You can't miss it. That's pypodcast.com and start being more of the leader you are meant to be today. This podcast was produced by Daniel Romeros. Show notes for this episode can be found over at pyppodcast.com. I'm Mary Lou Kayser. Thanks for listening. Here at the Play Your Position podcast, we believe that the road to self-mastery and a life well-lived starts with answering the call to leadership. That's when the fun really begins. Send this episode to any friends who might need to hear the inspiration and ideas you heard today. And feel free to rate and review us on your favorite podcast platform.